100 years ago in 1917, at the height of the carnage of the First World War, the Immaculate Mother of God appeared to three children in Portugal, entrusting them with a plan for world peace and with a warning about the dire consequences man would face if he did not convert from sin. Her peace plan, a series of simple requests, involves the whole church and all men of good will. Well, it's a, it's a joy to be with you. I thought perhaps I would be giving this presentation to the people in baggage claim in the Indianapolis airport. <laughs> On this day, I was going to give the Fatima message to somebody. Uh, <laughs> it's just nice to be here. Uh, let's just take a moment to pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you endlessly for the gift of our mother, your greatest creation. There's no way we can properly do her proper homage and, and, and love, help to expand our hearts this day on this 100th anniversary. No matter how much we love her, help us to love her more. De Maria Numquam Sadis. And give us the grace to be bold in her name because the more bold we are in her name, the more we serve her Son, our Lord, and give her the glory that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit want her to have. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Saint Joseph, patron of the church, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, you certainly don't need me to tell you that today is historic. There's, there's a monumental historic nature to today, and there's a corresponding grace to this day. To be sure, we don't start a hundred years back from today. Because to understand Fatima, we have to understand the mother as our mother in action. And that's why to understand today is not to simply go back a centenary, it's to go back two millennia. Because Fatima is an expression of Mary as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate in action, in history, in salvation. And unless we understand the origins of the mother, we're not going to understand the power of Fatima. And so, essentially, we go back to Nazareth today, and we hear and appreciate the yes of the 15 or 16-year-old virgin, the immaculate virgin, that brings the Redeemer into the world. Mother Teresa had it right. Of course, Mary's co-redemptrix. She gave Jesus his body, and his body is what saved us. When Mother Teresa said that to me, I said, Mother, that's the difference between saints and theologians. It takes you 30 seconds to say what it takes us books to write. <laughs> and then what happens? Then the mother presents the son, and she hears a painful prophecy. Your son will be a sign of contradiction, and your heart, too, will be pierced. What mother or father does not understand that. I remember a gentleman calling up on a radio program about 10 years ago. He said, why do people not get the co-redemptrix? My daughter, two months ago, had a life-threatening operation. It would have been easier for me to be on the operating table than in the waiting room. Easier. And most good parents says, that's absolutely right. That's not hyperbole. It's easier to endure this suffering than to watch your child suffer. So where's the mystery of Mary Corridemtrix? And then she goes to Cana, and then she intercedes for the first miracle. Her last words in scripture is, do whatever he tells you. You know, St. Maximilian was always fond of saying, and I, I so appreciate this. He says, you don't have to use the word Jesus every time you say Mary, in the sense that as we talk about the beauties of the mother, we don't always have to qualify, but, but, but Jesus, remember now, Jesus is God and Mary's not. We kind of know that. That's part of the family. Could you imagine going home after a long time being away and going to your mom and dad and saying, 
hi, John Smith, I, I'm your son, and, and, and Mary's your mother, and I'm her son, and I just want to make sure if, if I say something good about my mother, it's not against you, Dad. What nonsense. What? In a family. In a family. That's already set. Of course, as de Montfort starts the whole true devotion to Mary, without Jesus, Mary's less than an Adam. Okay? So let's say it and end it, and now let's talk about the glories of the mother. See, because that makes the son happy. And so at Cana, Mary intercedes for the miracle. She's a mediatrix. And she mediates every grace from that point onward. Why? Because the Holy Spirit saw that it was through Mary that the first uncreated grace of Jesus comes. Why would he stop there? Why would he not mediate every grace, every created grace, through the same immaculate channel as the mother? And then we go to Calvary. And what happens at Calvary? As St. John Paul II says, Mary is spiritually crucified with her crucified son as the co-redemptrix. But her role as co-redemptrix does not cease with the glorification of her son. Meaning it doesn't stop there. John Paul also said so beautifully, when Jesus says, behold your mother, intrinsic in the word mother is mediatrix. Why? Because a mother can't be a mother unless she's nourishing that's why Mary is the mother to us in the order of grace, Second Vatican Council. And what's fascinating, my friends, is the early church got this. They got it. Second century, St. Irenaeus, Mary is the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. Second century, about 180. The catacombs show that the mother and son are always united. St. Jerome, death through Eve, life through Mary. St. Ephraim, cum mediator, mediatrix todius mundi, with, with the mediator, you, Mary, are the mediatrix of the entire world. Read the fathers on Our Lady, and you'll see we're coming up short in our age. We're, we're the lightweights. In the first three centuries, they understood the power of a woman saying yes to reverse a woman saying no. And so we should have more love of the mother now, not less. We should have more development, more understanding, more fruitfulness. By the 5th century, she's called the liberatrix and the salvatrix in, in liturgies, in Eastern liturgies. By the 10th century, she's already called the co-redemptrix, sancto redemptrix, or pro nobis, a, a French psalter. Mary, the, the redemptrix with the redeemer. Now, of course, a co-redemptrix or redemptrix doesn't mean equal. Of course that's the case. The church doesn't put forward heresy. But if we do not call her the co-redemptrix, we do her an injustice, and we do Jesus an injustice. Because as the fathers say, God wanted to use the same three things that led to the loss of grace to restore it. And this would be a manifestation of his omnipotence. A man, a woman, a tree... And that's what he uses. And that's why the woman is not incidental. You want authentic feminism, authentic Christian feminism? Look to Mary. Look to God uses, God's use of Mary. He wanted a woman intimately involved in the work of redemption. By the 12th century, we have St. Bernard of Clairvaux. The compassion of Mary, the co-suffering of Mary, that Mary offered Jesus to the Father in an act of the will. And his disciple, Arnold of Chartres, saying, they did it together. They redeemed the world together with one heart, with one sacrifice. This is 12th century Mariology. And then St. Bonaventure. Eve participated in loss. Mary repairs this relationship. It continues on and on. The 16th century, Salmeron, the great theologian from Trent, says Mary's co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. This is the 16th century. 17th century, over 300 references to Our Lady as co-redemptrix and defending her co-redemption against the errors of Protestantism. You know, the Holy Father said last night at Fatima, if you want to be Christian, you must be Marian. Now that's a bumper sticker right there. 
you want to be Christian, you must be Marian. He just said it from Fatima last night. And so this is the richness of our faith on this question. So we come to the 18th century. We have St. Louis Marie de Montfort talking about a total gift of ourselves, a consecration. And this is what I love. We've got, we've got Louis de Marie de Montfort saying, become a slave of Our Lady. We've got St. Maximilian saying, be the holy property of Our Lady. We've got St. John Eudes saying, the heart of Mary and the heart of Jesus are so united, you can call it one heart. I told my students at Franciscan last week, I said, you got St. Maximilian at table, and then St. Louis de Montfort and St. John Eudes, they're all up in heaven. You know what they're saying to each other? They're saying, we could have said even more about the mother. They're not saying, oh, I went over the top. Yeah, I went over the top with her too. They're not saying that. They're saying, we could, have, we could have said even more. Now that we know her, now that we see her, now that we're in, in, in the fullness of who Mary is, we could have said more about her. That's the richness of our faith. So we get to the 19th century. And what happens? You have the beginning of the age of Mary. 1830, November 27th, the miraculous medal. Our Lady appears. What is she doing? Two images. The first image, she's stepping on the head of Satan. You know, sometimes scripture scholar says, well, you know, in the Latin and the Hebrew and the Greek, is it ipsa, ipsum? The Blessed Mother doesn't seem to be restricted by uh, different linguistic biblical scholars. She's crushing the head of Satan. It's the ipsa. And then her hands are open. She's a mediatrix of all grace. And then the prayer that surrounds the medal, O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Queen and advocate, immaculate queen and advocate, and then the metal turns, the vision turns around. What do you have? You have an M cross. Only the co-redemptrix is shown on both sides of the miraculous metal. And this is 1830. So it, it's telling us heaven wants these roles of Mary understood. Contemporaneous to this is a line of tremendous popes. Great Marian popes starting in the middle of the 19th century. Blessed Pius IX, Leo XIII teaching Mary's role in the redemption, calling her the mediatrix of all graces, making reference that, as Leo says, each and every grace of redemption comes through her intercession. That leads us to the 20th century. And the 20th century starts with a cardinal from Belgium, by 1915, Cardinal Mercier, saying, we've got to define this. We've got to proclaim that Mary is the world's spiritual mother. Why? One simple reason. Historic graces. If every other dogma has brought great graces, what about the dogma that's going to articulate Mary's role as our mother? That's her action. The more we acknowledge it, the more she's going to do that. 1917, what happens? We have the Pope, Benedict XV, calling out to the Queen of Heaven and Mediatrix of all graces for what? For the end of World War I. That's the context of what we celebrate today. Then we come to Fatima. And Fatima is Our Lady co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate in action, calling us. You know, you'll, you'll often hear this expression, and, and there's a sense where it's very true, that Fatima is the message of the gospel. A dear friend, uh, Ambassador Howard D., who was the former Vatican ambassador uh, from the Philippines, who met with John Paul II. In fact, John Paul called him Our Lady's ambassador because every time they got together, they talked about Our Lady. He also had a meeting with Cardinal Ratzinger, and he said, why is there not an encyclical on Fatima? And Cardinal Ratzinger responded, because an encyclical on Fatima would be an encyclical on the gospel. Now, it's absolutely true to say the message of Fatima is the message of the gospel, but I would say this too. Fatima is also the gospel applied to now. In other words, there's a prophetic dimension to Fatima that can't be ignored or distracted because we say, well, if it's the gospel, let's just go to the gospel. Why, why Fatima? And to be clear, the gospel, that's public revelation. That's what guides us. We know that. But my point is different here. My point is, Fatima is the gospel applied to now. Sister Lucia gave a fascinating interview to uh, John Haffert, the founder of the Blue Army, in 1999. And in this interview, Sister Lucia said to John Haffert, we are now in the third day of the week of Fatima. 
And it took John Haffert by surprise. Uh, John Haffert was a strong uh, devotee for the Fifth Marian dogma as well and said, we're not going to have the era of peace until we get this dogma. But when Sister Lucia responded that way, he was off, taken off guard a little bit and said, what does that mean? And Sister Lucia then went, went on to explain the first day of Fatima is the historical period of the apparitions, okay? First day. The second day is post-apparition, pre-consecration period. She said, now that the consecration has been done, which she said in over five interviews, over and over, the consecration has been done. Incidentally, when you have a position that's against the Pope of Fatima and the visionary of Fatima, you want to change your position because they both say the consecration has been done, okay? She says, we have four more days left of Fatima. So can we see why St. John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis of all have said Fatima is more relevant today than 1917? It's not done. So we can't ignore the prophetic dimension of Fatima as well. I want to take a moment because oftentimes we talk about these critical Marian messages, but we summarize them, we theologize them, which is all fine, but we have to get back to the words themselves. I, I want to take time and go back to what I would consider the single most important message of Our Lady in the 20th century, and that would be the July 13, 1917 Fatima message. And I want to just take the time to read that because this is the way we go back to basics in understanding the Fatima message. So bear with me and just ponder this message as if we were hearing it for the first time, okay? So July 13, 1917, from Sister Lucia's memoirs. A few moments after arriving at the Cova de Aria near the Homolk, where a large number of people were praying the rosary, we saw the flash of light once more, and a moment later, Our Lady appeared on the Homolk. What do you want of me, I asked, Our Lady. I want you to come here on the 13th of next month to continue to pray the rosary every day in honor of Our Lady of the Rosary in order to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war because only she can help you. I would like to ask you to tell us who you are and to work a miracle so that everyone will believe that you are appearing to us, Lucia. Our Lady, continue to come here every month. In October, I will tell you who I am and what I want, and I will perform a miracle for all to see and believe. I then made some requests, but I cannot recall just now what they were. What I do remember is that Our Lady said it was necessary for such people to pray the rosary in order to obtain these graces during the year. And she continued, sacrifice yourselves for sinners. And say many times, especially whenever you make some sacrifice, O oh Jesus, it is for love of you, for the conversion of sinners, and in reparation, for the sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. As Our Lady spoke these last words, she opened her hands once more, as she had done during the two previous months. The rays of light seemed to penetrate the earth, and we saw, as it were, a sea of fire. Plunged in this fire were demons and souls in human form, like transparent burning embers, all blackened or burnished bronze, floating about in the conflagration, now raised into the air by the flames that issued from within themselves together with great clouds of smoke, now falling back on every side like sparks in huge fires, without weight or equilibrium amid shrieks and groans of pain and despair, which horrified us and made us tremble with fear. It must have been this sight which caused me to cry out as people said they heard me. The demons could be distinguished by their terrifying and repellent likeness to frightful and unknown animals, black and transparent like burning coals. Terrified and as if to plead for succor, we looked up at Our Lady who said to us, so kindly and so sadly, you have seen hell, where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved, there will be peace. The war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the pontificate of Pius XI. When you see a knight illuminated by an unknown light, know that this is the great sign given you by God that he's about to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, famine, and persecutions of the church and of the Holy Father. 
to prevent this. I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. When you pray the rosary, say after each mystery, O oh my Jesus, forgive us, save us from the fire of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those who are in most need. Okay, a powerful message. As I said, arguably the single most important message in the 20th century. What then follows this message is the third secret of Fatima, which was revealed to Sister Lucia, to the, the visionary Lucia at, on this day, and ultimately revealed to us on June of 2000 uh, in, during the Jubilee year. Now, a couple comments on that message. It's a very pregnant message. First of all, notice where Our Lady says, pray the rosary to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war, because only she can help you. What does that mean? The Trinity is not concerned about peace in the world? Of course the Trinity is. The Trinity has given this task to the mother. And the sooner we recognize that Our Lady has the plan of peace for the world, the sooner we'll get there. Conversely, if we don't look to the mother, we will delay and retard the process of peace for the world. It really becomes that simple. She then gives us intentions where we're supposed to give offering. Now, I won't ask this question here because this is a chapel and a, a, a place where reparation is talked about. But apart from here, when was the last time you heard teaching or preaching on reparation? I asked my students from Franciscan, a good group of students, nearly a hand will go up that they've ever heard ever heard a teaching or preaching on reparation. It, it, it's, it's the heart of the Marian message of the modern world. We have to offer our sufferings and our sacrifices. And the irony is, we can't get out of most of them anyway. If I gave you 30 seconds to think of your two greatest sufferings right now, you'd probably get them in 15. And what does that mean? It means there's no question that we're suffering. The question is, what are we doing with our suffering? So there's the call to offer our sufferings, love of Jesus, conversion of sinners, and by the way, conversion of sinners is what we call co-redemption. So reparation is what we offer the hearts of Jesus and Mary. We actually have the ability of, of consoling their hearts. Co-redemption is what we do for each other. Co-redemption is saving other souls. That's why St. John Paul II called us to be co-redeemers in Christ. We want to bring as many people to heaven God willing ourselves making it as we can. Then the vision of hell, then the remedy. And we have the prophetic elements in that message. Uh, I was speaking uh, on the message of Fatima uh, in New Zealand a couple years back, it was Divine Mercy Sunday, and a gentleman came up to me after the presentation. He said, I finally understand what happens when we don't respond to Our Lady's message because my dad was the first soldier from New Zealand to be killed in World War II. And had we responded to Fatima, he'd still be alive. The point is, when we don't respond to Our Lady's messages, there are ramifications. She comes as a mother. She comes to save. So at Fatima... She's the quintessential co-redemptrix. In fact, she appears as the co-redemptrix on October 13, 1917, as Our Lady of Sorrows. Notice how she opens her hands at the beginning of the apparitions. That's mediatrix of all graces. And surely she's advocating, she's giving us a message for protection because God always prefers mercy, but if we don't respond, then remember, justice is a virtue. When God exercises justice, it's not the vengeful God, it's the just God who's still seeking our ultimate conversion. So to understand Fatima is to understand the co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate in historic action. 28 years later, in 1945, Our Lady appears again. Church-approved apparitions, Amsterdam. 
And she starts the same way she starts at Fatima. Say, pray the rosary for the end of the war. This time it's World War II. And she gives a series of prophecies, geopolitical prophecies, things like communism taking over China, Israel becoming a state, a vision of Korea with a line through it. Why so many ge geopolitical prophecies? Why would Our Lady tend to those? Because she wants to build credibility, not just to Catholics, but to the whole world, that this is a supernatural message. Well, what does she say at Amsterdam? She ultimately says that heaven desires the proclamation of the dogma of Mary as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. And goes on to say this critical line, that only with this proclamation will we obtain peace in the world. I want to read you this message. This is May 31st, 1954. Again, these are church-approved apparitions. Our Lady says, quote, the co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate is now standing before you. I have chosen this day. On this day, the Lady will be crowned. Theologians and apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, listen carefully. I have given you the explanation of the dogma. Work and ask for this dogma. You should petition the Holy Father for this dogma. From now on, all nations will call me blessed. The Lady of all nations wishes to unite in the true Holy Spirit. The world is covered by a false spirit, Satan. Once the dogma, the final dogma in Marian history has been proclaimed, the Lady of all nations will grant peace, true peace to the world. The nations, however, must say my prayer together with the church. They shall know that the Lady of all nations has come as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate, so be it. So 28 years after Fatima begins, Amsterdam confirms what's always already been a movement in the church for over 30 years. A movement started by Mercier in 1915. Heaven also uh, often does this. Heaven will take something that's in the church and it will confirm it. It's almost like using a divine highlighter. It's like divine mercy, right? I mean, did we not have divine mercy in scripture and tradition, the magisterium? Of course we did. But heaven knew that the 20th century and the 21st would need a new shot of mercy, a new emphasis of mercy. And so Jesus comes to Faustina. The same thing is here. This was a movement to make this definition, but heaven knew there'd be a need for an accent. And that's what happens in Amsterdam, a call to petition the Holy Father for the dogma. 28 years after Amsterdam begins, you have the beginning of another church-approved apparition, Akita, the Fatima of the East, approved in 1981 by the local bishop. The Akita Japan apparitions consist of locutions coming from and lacrimations, tears, coming from a statue of what? The Lady of All Nations, carved by a Buddhist sculptor at the request of a nun who believed she had received a healing through the Lady of All Nations. The bishop in Japan says that Akita is the continuation of Amsterdam. And that is the call for this proclamation. So three successive church-approved Marian apparitions speak about this. And it all focuses on peace. You know, uh, I used to live in Berkeley, California years back, and, uh, which was an experience. Uh, and there was bumper stickers everywhere. In Berkeley, it was, uh, you know, visualize peace, you know, strive for peace, hope for peace. There was even one bumper sticker that said smoke peace, which <laughs> would be typical for Berkeley. I never lived in a more peaceless place in my whole life than Berkeley. So this is not just a nice saying. It's kind of like the word love in the 70s. Everybody said it, but no one defined it. When the world was it? See? We can do the same thing with peace. This peace that Our Lady promises at Fatima, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph and a period of peace will be granted to the world. It will be true peace because it will be the peace of Christ in the soul. And when we have peace, the peace of Jesus in the soul, then we have marital peace. Then marriages stay together. Then we have family peace. Then social peace. And then ultimately, global peace. But it has to be based on the peace of Christ in the soul. And that's why it demands a proclamation. Now, one might object, 
well, what, what does a proclamation of a theological truth have to do with peace in hearts and peace in families? And the answer is everything. Because you don't get the peace of Christ except through the mediatrics of all graces. And the mediatrics of all graces can't fulfill her task entirely until we give her our consent. Is this most remarkable? How God the Father waited for the fiat of a young virgin to bring us Jesus. Now, that young virgin, who is our mother, waits for our fiat to bring us the graces of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. It means we have to consent. Because Augustine's right. God can create us without us, but he can't save us without us. That means we have to cooperate. So how does all this culminate? It culminates in responding to Our Lady's messages. So we have the Fatima call, praying the rosary. I don't know what heaven could do more to call us to pray the rosary than what heaven has done. If you notice at the end of St. John Paul II's apostolic letter on the rosary, it shows how desperate he is because he will say, bishops, priests, even theologians, I call you to instruct people on the rosary. Now that's a de desperate plea when he's asking us theologians to do it. He does, he, he literally begs us to pray the beads. And Our Lady over and over and over tells us. So, of course, we have to recommit. And families, for all the worrying and suffering and talking and potential therapy we have to get because of family life and children, nothing equates to those beads. Think of your family, think of your house at home, and think of a golden rosary surrounding them. And then think of demons trying to get past it, but they get blocked because of that rosary. I do not think that's an exaggeration. That's the power of when we pray the rosary as families. We've got to do it. It might have been a luxury before. It's, it's, a, it's a necessity now. We've got to pray it. This is a great day to renew our consecration because the Fatima message is a message of consecration. But as well, you heard Our Lady's request about praying and petition for this fifth Marian dogma. You see, see we, we sometimes, we break these things up. You know, there's the Lourdes people and the Fatima people. It's one mother. And it's one message. And so if we want to seek the fulfillment of Fatima, we also have to obey what she asked for at Amsterdam and Akita, because it's the same mother. And so I encourage you, please keep the fifth Marian dogma in your prayers. Now, Our Lady gave a particular prayer, which she asked us to pray. It's a prayer called, now, the Prayer of the Lady of All Nations. You can download it. You can, you can get, it's all over the place on the internet. She asked every person to pray that prayer to prepare the world for the fifth dogma. I would take her word for it. I, I would say that the prayer is even more important than the part two, because the part two is petitioning the Holy Father. Now, Petition the Holy Father might say, well, you know, who am I to petition the Pope? The answer is, you're a member of the body of Christ. Uh, the only concern with this Holy Father is if you petition him, you might get a call back. Uh, he's done it many times. In fact, he did it uh, about a year ago to a, to a man in, in uh, northern Italy. And uh, the guy picks up. He says, this is Pope Francis. And he hung up the phone because he thought it was a gag. And the Holy Father called him back. <laughs> Got two calls. <laughs> so... Clearly, my friends, option A is that heaven asks the Holy Father to do something heroic for Our Lady, to crown Mary, but he does it all by himself. He doesn't do it with any support or help by the faithful. Option B is that the Holy Father crowns Our Lady with this dogma with millions and millions and millions of faithful saying, Holy Father, we are with you. We support you in this. We want to put our hands on that crown with you. Okay? We want option B. So I encourage you, on this great historic day, petition the Holy Father for this dogma. You can write a letter to him. The address is very simple. It's called Pope Francis, Vatican City. They're not going to get it confused. Okay? <laughs> Pope Francis, Vatican City. We now have, as of a week ago a new website called crownmary.com where you can send a petition to the Holy Father in 60 seconds from your smartphone. 
crownmary.com. So you can do it either way. You can write him a little note from your heart to his, or you can just go to crownmary.com. This is the fulfillment of Fatima. I had the honor of speaking with Sister Lucia, who, by the way, signed a petition for the Fifth Marian Dogma. We were contacted by uh, the religious superior at her house. And on the day where John Paul beatified Yashinta and Francisco, I was able to speak with Sister Lucia, and she absolutely sees this Fifth Dogma as the fulfillment of Fatima. So let's do our part. Let's cooperate with the mother so she can bring us the grace and peace we all want. We all want a triumph. We all want peace. Let's do our part. Thank you. God bless.